the Mystic Seafarers Trail, and we are actually on the Mystic Seafarers Trail right now. We're off the shore of Noank at the moment, and I am on the boat Thunderfish with Captain Bill Palmer. I have always dreamed my whole life of meeting a shipwreck explorer, and I finally did it when I moved to Mystic, and you can do it too, actually, because his boat is here in Mystic for the summer. We're here to interview him about what's going on down the Mystic River, in Fisher's Island Sound, off Block Island, off Fisher's Island, the different shipwrecks that Bill explores and finds artifacts on, and even some dead bodies. We're steaming out the Mystic River, and we're gonna very shortly turn the wheel to the south and head towards Fisher's Island, which is about uh, maybe a little less than a mile off the coast of Connecticut. And ironically enough, it's owned by New York, so we have to abide by the New York laws. In 1895 or thereabouts, the uh, Spanish steamer Olinda in dense fog went aground and went to pieces on the south side of the island, and that's where we're headed. We're talking about shipwrecks that sunk in the, uh, the 1800s, early 1900s. There wasn't any radar. So, uh, without the modern electronics, you know, navigation was somewhat difficult, especially in the fog. Some captains chose to sit on the anchor until the fog lifted. Others didn't, and uh, they paid the price, such as the Olinda. Believe it or not, on the chart, there's a little area marked Wreck Island and that's the final resting place of the Olinda. Not much there. A couple boilers, a propeller shaft, rudder, uh, scattered wreckage, plates, but it's a phenomenal dive in the sense that the visibility generally is always good. It's a white sandy bottom, there's little to no current, and it's a great place for the beginner, or for that matter, even the experienced diver. One can virtually stand on the deck of the boat and look down in 20 feet of water and see the wreck. Although it's not really recognizable as a wreck because it's covered with kelp and other forms of marine life. But it, it's a great, great dive and it's a great area. Heck, man, you could go there just to relax and in, uh, enjoy it. Uh, sort of like a sanctuary. It is a little tiny uh, nature-like breakwater, uh, there's comrades that uh, lay on it, so it's I, I thoroughly enjoy going there. You mean laying on it? You mean at low tide, it's sticking out? Yeah, it's a natural rock formation, and um, you can see it in some of the pictures that I have of the Olinda. I mean, it hasn't changed in well over 100 years. And what's, uh, what's sort of wild is uh, you become a, a naturalist, comrades. They're birds that uh, feed on fish on the bottom or, you know, in mid-water. And they have no oil in their wings or very little oil. So these birds will uh, come out of the water, sit on the rocks or pilings, and elongate their wings and dry them out so that they can take flight. So, yeah, it, it's, it's a beautiful place. Now, with all these recent hurricanes we've had up here in the Northeast, do you think any of the shipwrecks that you regularly go to could reveal new treasure of any kind? Oh, absolutely. Most wrecks, if not all wrecks, carried large amounts of gold, silver, jewels, precious stones, and uh, paper currency. But that's mostly gone, so we're just looking for the gold today. So was there loss of life? No, not on the Olinda. You know, like... Um, you know, relatively shallow water. Generally, when you have fog, it's calm. The only, uh, <laughs> the only thing that you don't have is the ability to free yourself from the, the rocks or the sand. And that was the case of the Olinda. You go a couple miles down the coast uh, to the east, and you've got the Onondaga. Now, the Onondaga was the Clyde Line steamship that, again, dense fog, hit uh, the end of... Uh, Watch Hill, what I call Watch Hill Reef, which is right across from the Coast Guard Station. And she sank in 50 feet of water. And again, attributed uh, to a dense, dense fog. You know, sometimes, you know, like the other day, I was out here and I had less than 400 feet of visibility. So, yeah, you know, you're steaming along. You can't stop a boat of that magnitude. Small boats such as mine, sure you can, but... Something that big, you know, it's got so much momentum that that's it. When are people uh, hitting rocks, formations? Because New England has a very rocky coastline. Is that what they're hitting? 
Yeah, um, there's a reef that stretches from the end of Fisher's Island east to uh, Watch Hill, Rhode Island. And it's uh, all up and down reef. I mean, there's a couple passages through it, such as Lord's Passage, Wikipedia Passage. But again, in the days where there was no electronics, you know, that reef claimed a lot, a lot of ships. As a matter of fact, Admiral Perry's flagship in the, uh, I think it was 1814, struck that reef, Watch Hill Reef, on the other side of where the Onondaga sunk. And she went down. Uh, matter of fact, they, uh, they tried to free her by uh, lightening the load, such as dumping cannon, anything that they could get rid of to free themselves. And uh, I think she was eventually pulled off, but anything that could be thrown overboard was. So the War of 1812, there were a lot of ships wrecked out here, right? For some British ships. Do you know anything about those? Um, the only one I know about is the Revenge, you know, Perry ship. But, you know, during the Revolution, um, Newport Harbor, there's a half a dozen British men of war. You know, they were, they were smaller. And I'm not sure of... Um, you know what type they were but the French had the uh, harbor blockaded and what the English did is they set the ships on fire and ran them aground so they couldn't be uh, used against them you know they were they were gonna be captured so yeah there's a half a dozen uh, British men of war in Newport Harbor one is right off the uh, the Newport uh, War College in like 30 feet of water and all that's left are ballast stones and some cannon now in our waters, especially in the summertime, we have worms that eat wood. So what you're going to find now is anything that's of steel or rock. Um, anything that's wood basically is gone because the worms have eaten it. Now, you've been on a lot of wrecks where there was loss of life, like the Andrea Doria. That's a famous one. They call it the uh, Mount Everest of shipwreck diving. Why do they call that one the Mount Everest of shipwreck? Well, I guess it's such a challenge to get to. You know, first of all, it's about 40 miles off Nantucket in a uh, major shipping lane from Europe to New York. And uh, it, at times there's a, a vicious, vicious current that you can't swim against. It's deep, it's in 250 feet of water. And, uh, and just until recently, you know, uh, let's say in the last 20 years, people have died on that wreck owing to the fact that uh, the equipment that they were using, uh, you know, was not suitable for that depth, but yet people still wanted to try to do it. If you look right over here, that's uh, that's Ram Island, okay, right to our south. And uh, I want to say around 1932-38, the Brenton Reef Lightship caught fire. She was at the docks here in Noank, missed it, and they cut her loose. And she drifted up onto uh, the beach where she uh, burnt and fully sank. And over the years, there's, there's virtually nothing left except for a few bronze spikes. Now, there's some uh, really tragic shipwrecks off this area, some that you feel very emotional about. And you've even found uh, bodies, remain, human remains on. Um, do you have a particular wreck that holds a lot of meaning to you or a list a few that have and what you've seen and what you think? Well, yeah, the, you know, they, they all do, really. The U-853, which is off Block Island, seven miles uh, east of Block Island. I mean, the crew is still aboard. One man decided the fate of uh, 49 others, and, and that was the captain of the boat, and he didn't make a wise decision. He uh, was ordered to cease all hostilities four days before the war ended, and he never acknowledged and I think that was a matter of choice because he was still looking for prey. And when I saw this submarine coming into view, I, the excitement again was, was just, uh, just outrageous. I think I covered that whole submarine in about five minutes. I swam well, like I was possessed to the bow. I swam to the stern, back to the anchor line and up. It was. Uh, it was amazing. I think I even cherished the rust I had on my wetsuit as being part of the U-boat. Right. And, and what sticks in my mind especially is the former captain of that U-boat was wounded and while recuper, uh, recuperating from his wounds, 
the uh, the captain that's still with her to this day, Firmsdorf, went to visit him. And Captain Summer said, listen, the war's nearly at an end. Do not be frivolous with the crew. They're all good boys. Make sure you bring them home. And uh, Firmsdorf uh, said, yeah, he would. And here they sit to this day waiting to come home. And that, that to me is very, very sad. My partner and I are going to start to explore the interior of this once mighty hunter. As I said before, it's a tight squeeze, and if you're claustrophobic, don't try it. my pressure gauges over my head and finally, and I say finally, manage to squeeze inside. Once inside, I acclimate myself, then start to move forward to explore the forward torpedo room. Bill signals me he's okay. I'll then swim through the bulkhead, being careful not to get hung up on pipe or conduit. To my immediate left is a torpedo in its rack, awaiting the order to be loaded. Thank God it never came. Still moving forward, the two top tubes come into view. The starboard one has a girl's name written on it, Hannah Laura. The doorway in front of us leads to the galley. On either side of the door, the steel has almost rotted away, leaving just a frame. In the NCO quarters aboard the UH-53, the crew is still present. These young men ranged in age from 18 to 22 years old. I slowly keep moving astern. As I do so, I have to squeeze through these narrow door openings, making sure not to get hung up. In front of me is a doorway that leads into the captain's and officer's quarters. Before entering, I turn to my left and I wonder how this one stove did the cooking for 50 plus men. Looking to my right, still more of the crew is visible. Moving into officer country, it's a total mess. One has to proceed with extreme caution. Here I look at collapsed lockers and miscellaneous piping. The silt in this area is three or four feet thick. Once you disturb this fine silt, your visibility goes to absolute zero. And now you have to feel your way out. Swimming into the control room, Directly in front of me is the periscope well, as well as piles of 20 millimeter and 37 millimeter ammunition. To my left is the plainsman station. Not much room to move around. On the deck is an ammunition container, and behind it is the attack periscope. This ammunition container contains 20 millimeter rounds. It was once bolted to the wall. We're looking at where the captain sat, looking into the periscope. This is where the attack was planned and carried out. Backing out, I look up into the conning tower and beyond. Very sad. Now, they did actually pull one body right after the wreck from it, and he's buried locally, right? He's buried in Newport, and that was in 1960. When you're, you've gone there and see that somebody leaves a rose there, what does it say on the stone if they can't identify the body? Well, you know, a friend of mine alerted me to that. He said, you know, every time he's gone to that particular cemetery to do research, he's noticed that at that grave someone has left flowers. No other graves, but that grave. So it, it's sort of a mystery as to who 
and why I would leave uh, leave flowers there. All it says is a U8 crew member, a U853. The one wreck that I keep thinking about is the one where they wrecked in um, winter and the bodies were encased in ice and came up to shore on Block Island. Which wreck is that? That's the Larchmont. She was wrecked on February the 11th, 1907, approximately two miles south of Watch Hill. And that's, that's really, a, really a tragic story. The Larchmont was bound uh, from Providence to New York uh, with a load of cargo and passengers, and she was a paddle wheel steamer. It was a, a blizzard, meaning that she was, uh, or a north northwester, she was blowing a 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 miles an hour, and it was a, a blizzard as well. So, I mean, you've got snow coming down sideways, and again, no navigation equipment, no radar. You know, we're fortunate to have that. Out of the storm appeared a coal schooner, the Harry Knowlton, who was making all available speed because he was landlocked, you know, for several days and behind schedule. And unfortunately, trying to avert the collision, the Larchmont actually turned into the bow of the Knowlton. The uh, Larchmont burst into flames because the main steam drum exploded and she sunk in something like 10 minutes. Now, you know, the water temperature was probably like, you know, February the 11th, 32 degrees, because salt water freezes at, what, 28. So uh, people took to the lifeboats, jumped into the water, but there was, there was little hope for survival. And if you read the newspaper articles, one man actually committed suicide by slashing his throat, knowing that uh, he was just going to sit there and suffer till he expired. So he, he preferred to end it rather than go through all the suffering. There were 17 survivors. Amongst them were, was the captain who had rowed around the lee side of the boat in the hopes of picking up passengers, but the wind was so damn fierce that it blew him away. And I believe with him was a small boy who managed to survive. And like I say, there were 17 survivors. Most of the bodies washed up on the northern end of Block Island. They laid there encased in ice and transported to the North Light, which is a lighthouse on the end of Block Island stacked like you would cordwood until they were able to be brought back to the mainland. Well, for more information on the Mystic Seafarers Trail and to read the excerpts of the book, you can visit my website at authorlisasaunders.com. For more information about Captain Bill Palmer and his book and finds and films on these shipwrecks, go to thunderfishcharters.com. Thank you. Hoping to see you on the Thunderfish someday.